Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Crazy stuff to talk about today. So, as we have been talking about in this, uh, in this unit here in civic literacy, about challenges to American ideals. We've been specifically talking about the Civil Rights Movement and how African Americans were not given the rights that they were promised in the Constitution, even after the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, that there is a race of people in the United States that were absolutely being treated as second class citizens. And the civil rights movement in and of itself was to bring awareness to the rest of the country about what was happening to American citizens in certain parts of the country. Uh, and we're gonna start talking about specific instances today of how that was done, why it was done, and what the response was uh, to these movements. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So yesterday we talked about Martin Luther King Jr. and how he'd come out with the Montgomery bus boycott uh, after Rosa Parks was arrested. The NAACP came and asked him to create um, an organization or, or movement to boycott the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. It worked out very well. Change had happened due to that concept of civil disobedience, of uh, refusing to follow uh, unethical laws, e even if it meant dealing with the legal consequences of that. So Martin Luther King Jr., while he never is the leader of the NAACP, they work together often, he is the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As we talked about, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, uh, is a Christian first, and, and he's the first one to say that. His ideas of nonviolence, right, of civil disobedience, that concept can be seen around the country at this time. Uh, one of the most famous ones that catches on very quickly was this concept of sit-ins. Now, this is a, a, a very famous uh, picture. Uh, these four men, and if you're like, wait a minute, Ms. Wagstaff, there's clearly three there. Somebody had to take the picture, right? There's no selfie sticks. Uh, I'm dating myself even right now saying that. Uh, uh, that somebody had to take a picture. So four men, all right, college students, four African-American men, college students, from Shaw University in North Carolina, decide to challenge a rule here. Now, North Carolina is one of the reasons uh, that this is gonna get challenged in North Carolina. North Carolina is in the South. There is segregation, and we're gonna talk about the segregation law that they're gonna challenge. North Carolina had segregation laws. There's a lot of racism in North Carolina. However, North Carolina, you would be less likely uh, to be lynched, which means murdered, uh, for standing up against this as an African-American uh, male or female to these segregation laws. Whereas this same protest that they're going to do here, ha if it had been done in, in Alabama or Mississippi, it, it may not have turned out the same way. Uh, there's a much higher risk of vicious violence uh, by doing this in the deeper South area. All right, let me tell you what we're talking about here. So there is a chain store called Woolworths back in the day. The reason Woolworths pretty much went out of business is because of the, of the publicity associated with this over time. Like Walmart, where there's a Walmart in every town, there is a Woolworths in every town. Inside the Woolworths is a department store. You get clothes, maybe a bicycle. You know, it's just had a whole bunch of different stuff inside it. There's also a diner inside every Woolworths. You could go eat lunch at the Woolworths. The Woolworths existed throughout the country. Places that didn't have segregation, places that did have segregation. Depending on where the Woolworths was, had different rules. Well, the Woolworths in North Carolina, in Greensboro, North Carolina, to be exact, uh, since North Carolina was had Jim Crow laws, was segregated, African-Americans could only order food to go from the, uh, the counter at the Woolworths. Only white people could sit at the counter and eat at the Woolworths. So these four men from Shaw University, which is in Raleigh, are gonna to travel to Greensboro purposely to bring awareness to the fact that this is happening in Woolworths. Because if you're in a Woolworths in New York City, nobody cares. If you're black and you go sit down, it, it's, it's not a problem. You're not allowed to do it in North Carolina. So these four men show up and they go sit down at a lunch counter at Woolworths. Now, when this picture is taken, 
Uh, you, you, you can see that the lady here, uh, uh, it's white getting up, getting up and leaving. I'm not sure if she is directly uh, understands what's getting ready to, to happen here, but uh, that I could have just been a coincidence in, in the picture. Um, that they want this to be an issue. They sit down and the lady working there, you can see her in the picture, she says, you, have, you can only sit here if, if you're white. And they say, no, we're gonna sit here and we would like to be served. Uh, obviously, that's not gonna happen because they're, they're wrecking the rule and she says, you have to leave. Well, what ends up happening is what happens a lot of places when these sit-ins happen. And this is actually what they need to happen. There's a lot of people go there walking by because it's a busy area, it's a major department store. People start seeing this. White people, now your, your non-racist white people probably aren't gonna stop at the time. But people who are upset that there's black people sitting here breaking this rule will start making a little uh, crowd, all right, around these young men, all right, and they're going to start telling them to move. It's going to start escalating. It's going to start being ugly. And that is exactly what happens here at Greensboro. What happens here at Greensboro, right, with these four men from Shaw University, what happens here catches the attention of the country. And these sit-ins happen everywhere because I'm gonna tell you what happens here, but it's the same thing that happens everywhere. And I'll give you other examples. So what ends up happening here is there's a crowd of people that are very angry, all right? And they feel like these black people are overstepping their bounds because there's just a, a law that allows it to be segregated. So they'll start attacking the black people that are sitting here. This is a picture of another sit-in, and, and they all pretty much end the exact same way, all right? Uh, sometimes it'll be uh, uh, students, white and black students, together to, to show solidarity that they are against it. The crowds behind our field, they'll, they'll start pouring drinks on them. You, you can see the, uh, the, the, they'll put cigarettes out on them. They'll start hitting them. It'll get aggressive, more violent, where they start being attacked and shoved and, and, and just viciously attacked here by a mob of white people as the people sitting at the counter, the black people sitting here saying, we just want to be served. There's no, there, there's no fighting back. It is a nonviolent protest, even though they are being attacked. When you go into this, you know, you know this is what the outcome is going to be. This is a, this is a photograph as they go and sit down. Look at the eyes. They know what, the, what, what they're doing. It's a very powerful symbol they're afraid, but they know it's necessary to bring awareness to this. So when they go sit down, horrible things happen to them. The crowd shows up, they're, they're, they start hitting them. And you're like, Mr. Rice, where are the police? The, the police show up. And you're like, oh, thank goodness to put it into this. Yes, the police show up, put it into it. Because when the police show up, they arrest the black people that were sitting at the counter. Not the white people that were actually assaulting them but the black people because they instigated it by sitting there. This is a, uh, a new paper coming from, from a lot, 116 students, all right? Uh, and basically talking about the demonstrators being knocked down and it's completely, it is the fault of the black people for attempting to sit at a place they know they're not allowed to sit. Now, this is really important. And the question here is, why were the sit-ins so effective? And, and, and we're getting ready to talk about that in a second, but it really brought awareness because it seems it's insane. They're getting beat up because of where they're sitting, because of the color of their skin. But most importantly, why was North Carolina chosen as the first place for the first sit-in? Uh, if you went further south, uh, it could have turned out, it could have ended up in a murder, honestly, instead of just getting harassed and beat up. If you do it in New York City, it's not even segregated there. It wouldn't mean a thing. So North Carolina, <clears throat> it was still segregated, but the chances of a lynching, which is, is murder, uh, was lower than the deeper south that you went. So the reason the sit-ins were so crazy effective is the same reason as we talked about the Little Rock Nine, how it galvanized people because they saw it on TV. These non-violent protests, which Martin Luther King Jr. was a proponent of, a supporter of, these non-violent protests 
were extremely important. Just going on a march, you had to bring out the military with bayonets, all right? Going on a march, they might release police dogs on you. Uh, they uh, will tear gas you, all right? Just going on, on a march, they'll bring the water hoses on you from the fire trucks. Now, the water hoses, you're, you're not getting sprayed with a water hose when they don't do it anymore because <clears throat> of the civil rights, but this is the way you would break up riots. This is clearly not a riot. It is a protest which you are allowed under the First Amendment of the Constitution. You have the freedom of assembly and the freedom to protest. But if you're black, those are taken from you. Now, the reason this is different here for the first time is all of these horrific things that happen, and they're peaceful. The violence is being done to them. They are not uh, 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 giving violence back. It's for the first time ever. It's all on TV. Everybody sees this on TV around the whole country. All right? So if you lived in Montana, where there might, if you were white and lived in Montana, you may never have seen a black person before. And all you know about uh, black people is what you're being told by the government of these states. Oh, black and white people just can't get along. They just can't do it as best if it stays segregated, if you were even aware of segregation. But now, you can live in Montana, and you see on TV, wait, these people are just walking and you're attacking them? They're just sitting down and you're attacking them? They're just using their rights and you're attacking them? All of a sudden, a lot of people who had never thought about what has happened to black people in the South, in the United States, are now on the side of African Americans because television showed the whole story. Television is incredibly important to the civil rights movement. TV shows the entire story, not just the narrative that black and white people have to be segregated, otherwise bad things will happen. Apparently, yeah, bad things will happen, but the white people are the bad guys. And white people, around the country, the majority of people around the country started realizing this is unacceptable and it really does start to be a change in the way uh, society views these rules that used to be acceptable under Jim Crow and now society's like, I don't think so because they're able to see it on television. Seeing really does change people's perspectives. So the question is, how was television used to help the civil rights movement? Uh, we just talked about that, so pause me if you need to, answer that completely, and, and we're moving on. So, we're trying to change these rules in the civil rights movement uh, to make it more equitable, all right? Because there's these rules that say, you know, you have to be segregated. There's a lot of people in the civil rights movement trying to tear that down. The Freedom Riders are a unique situation. I shouldn't say unique. It is a... Ah, let's just tell you a story. I'm going to try to come up with an adjective for it. Uh, so there is a law, all right, after uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s bus boycott that happened in Montgomery, Alabama, with the federal government, they're like, you know what? Having segregated buses is bad. So whenever a bus is on a federal highway, which is like I-40, I-95, uh, interstate highway that, that's federally owned and, and, and controlled, um, when that happens, you can't segregate buses, all right? So the United States government was super excited. They're so proud of themselves. They're like, oh, look, we, we passed this law, high five self, good job. But people that live in the South are like, wait a minute, federal government that's up in Washington, D.C., uh, just because you pass a law here in Georgia and Alabama does not mean that they're going to follow it. And the United States government's like, oh, I'm sure they will. It's a law. Why would they not say, why, why would they not follow it? So. A lot of college students decided in, 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 uh, in 1961, all right, we're going to prove to you, the federal government, that the South, unless you go and force laws that you make, they're not going to listen to you. So a whole bunch of white students and black students uh, all trained for this because they know it's, it's going to get crazy. And they get on buses, all right, and they're going to travel all the way through the South and they're going to let everybody know as they travel through the South, hey, we are not going to be segregated on this bus and there's nothing you can do about it. Because technically the law is you can't be segregated on the bus. But that's not the rule when you get down to the South, in South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama. So they start out on this tour and they announce to all these states, hey, guess what? We're coming down there. We're not segregated because it's against the law to segregate us. And the federal government's like, whatever. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. And they come on down through North Carolina 
They're coming down through South Carolina, no, no issues. They get into Georgia. There's some weird situations that happen in Georgia. When they get to Alabama, they're driving down the road. There's already been tension. A couple of the bus drivers have already quit because some crazy stuff had happened. They're driving down the road and it's blocked by a massive herd of people in the middle of the highway. And this is the interstate highway, all right? This is not some backcountry road, interstate highway. It is blocked by a whole bunch of white people and the KKK. And the Ku Klux Klan and the community go drag the white and black students off of this bus that are not being segregated. They set the bus on fire. They beat the riders brutally. Uh, at the actual beating, there was no riders that died at the scene. There were some other instances where uh, it, lots of violence took place. Pure luck, they people didn't die. It wasn't that they weren't trying to like not kill them. It just people ended up not dying, but they were beat viciously. This is a picture after the bus. These are some of the riders uh, that, that, that are busted up. Notice the guys here in the suits. So this is the next day. These guys in the suits are the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. When they arrive on the scene to kind of, you know, put all the pieces together, see what happened here on this federal highway, they realize they're the first people to arrive. This is the next day. Buses on fire. The police never showed up. And they're like, what? That, that's crazy, but by anybody's standards, all right? And the Freedom Riders like, we told you, like, the, the, <laughs> the KKK, this community, they're not going to allow you to be uh, segregated, all right? They're not going to follow federal law. You have to enforce this. And, then, and it catches you the FBI off guard and they're like, all right, well, you know what? We're going to go, we're going to go get to the bottom of this, all right? And, and newspaper reporters and everything. Again, TV, very important here. So JFK is the president. JFK watches, all right, as they go interview the head of the police at the time in the region, the guy who's supposed to send out the police to go do this. A guy named Bull Connor. Bull Connor, all right, he looks like a lovely guy, doesn't he? Bull Connor, when they're interviewing him, they're like, why didn't you send the police out to stop this? This dude on national TV, knowing he's recorded, not like he got caught off guard, he said, because I think those N-words got what they deserved. What? Then, to find out, you know why no police showed up? Because they were in the crowd. A lot of them were in the Klan themselves. The police, in plain clothes, are a lot of people who beat these writers. When that information comes out, Bull Connor suffers no consequences at the time. He does later in life. Uh, but Bull Connor suffers no consequences at the time. Actually, it doesn't even hurt his political career. That's how crazy this is. Uh, that when JFK saw this on TV, he said, whoa. This is a wake up call to the federal government that just because you make a law doesn't mean it gets enforced. And the federal government realizes they're gonna have to take a more active role in this civil rights movement than just you know, passing a law, wiping your hands, and moving on. That has not been effective. When the federal government make, makes a rule now, they have to go in and enforce it. Otherwise, you have people like Bull Connor that are just going to ignore it and do the complete opposite. So the question here is, what was the purpose of the Freedom Riders, and how did this get the attention of the federal government? So, again, even after the federal government passes a law that seems like a win, if it's not aggressively enforced, it's just not followed. We, we, we saw this with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that led to voting tax, uh, 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 poll taxes and literacy tests to prevent black people from voting even though they had the 15th Amendment that gave them the right to do it. So you're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy. I, I bet that's the craziest story you got today. Not, not even close. Not, I mean, the, the stories just get crazier. Let me tell you a story about old James Meredith here. All right, James Meredith. He graduated top of his class from high school, went and served honorably in World War II where he was an officer. Highly decorated, all right? When he gets back, all right, uh, in, in, into the United States, uh, he decides he wants to go to college. 
So, he's from Mississippi, all right? He applies to Ole Miss University. Ole Miss looks at his application and is like, oh my gosh, this guy's got a 4.0 GPA when he was in high school. He served in World War II. He is a war hero. He is an officer. Absolutely, let's let James Meredith into our college at Ole Miss University. So, they accepted him. Ole Miss, uh, when James Meredith shows up on the first day of school, Ole Miss loses its collective mind. See, what they didn't realize, James Meredith is black, and Ole Miss University is an all-white school. James Meredith never lied on his application. It just never asked if you were white or black because they assumed no black person would ever apply to the all-white school. They let him in with flying colors, proving their only issue with him was the fact that he is black. So when he shows up to class, shows up to school, the Ross Barnett, the governor of, uh, uh, th this is uh, Ross Barnett uh, right here. Uh, Ross Barnett is the governor of, uh, of Mississippi, tells the students that when James Meredith here tries to enroll in class, tells the students to burn the school down instead of letting James Meredith into the school. Rather, burn it down, than, and, and the, the N-word gets thrown around quite a bit here. Now, you see this Confederate flag, and this is a U.S. history thing, but it, it, I, I do want to mention it here. The Confederate flag that you commonly see in the Civil War, like any paintings or whatever, it, it's, a, it's usually the battle flag of uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia battle flag with Robert E. Lee's, uh, and it's a it's a square and it's a cross turned sideways. It has to be a square because it's, it's it's a cross turned sideways. Uh, this rectangle version doesn't come out really until after Brown versus Board of Education. This rectangle version of the Confederate flag doesn't really exist until the 1950s as a symbol of anti-integration, of not wanting to integrate schools, of supporting segregation. It has a different meaning because it is a rectangle which distorts the cross, which is the cross turned sideways on the on the battle flag. Uh, it is rectangle. So uh, the at this time period, when you see these rectangle flags, that is 100% a racially motivated symbol, uh, tries, saying that whoever's flying that flag supports the idea that black people and white people should not go to school together. Right. Uh, they end up having to send in the paratroopers again, like it was very similar to Little Rock Nine to Ole Miss. Kids did try to burn down the school. They had to like stop it. Ole Miss almost caught on fire and they showed up. And the reason this is different is Ole Miss isn't a private university. It's a public school paid more by taxpayer money. James Meredith, who's black and lives in Mississippi, pays taxes that pay for Ole Miss. The federal government says you can't take tax money from black people and then say black people can't attend your school. It is a public university. That was the difference. If it was a private school, they could at this time they could still do whatever they wanted to do. But since it's a public school, the federal government's like, no. They had to send in troops once again, and the whole campus was very tense. But James Meredith here does attend school, does graduate, all right, from Ole Miss. He, these are like his bodyguards that, that walk with him uh, while he is uh, in, enrolled there because it was such a tense situation. So uh, the question is, why was James Meredith originally accepted to the all-white Ole Miss University if he was black? Uh, we, we talked about that. Uh, pause me and answer that completely. Here, this is, this is wild, and I was doing some research making sure I got, got my facts straight here and there as I was uh, uh, prepping uh, for this lesson, and I did not know this, and this blows my mind. James Meredith, when he graduates, because he does graduate from Ole Miss University, he's the first black person to graduate from Ole Miss University, uh, is part of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, there were areas that, uh, if you were black, still by 1966, you weren't supposed to walk. James Meredith is going to point that out. He's a civil rights leader. I'm going to show you this picture, and it seems horrific, and it is. This is James Meredith getting shot, and I'm going to explain it to you. He does survive this and makes a full recovery, so this is why I show, show the picture, uh, because it is, it is crazy this happened. James Meredith walking by him with, you know, uh, to prove how dangerous it is in, in, in these areas, walking from one part of town to another after he had graduated college. 
guy comes up and shoots him with a shotgun as he is walking by himself. Like, people are watching him walk. Like, it, it, it's a public, like, it's a known protest that he was going to walk by himself to show how dangerous it is for a black man to walk in uh, areas between one public place and another. He is shot three times with a 16 gauge shotgun. One of the point, like, this is actually, uh, uh, he has crawled all the way across the street. He actually got shot coming out of the, the woods there in the back. Crawls all the way across, across the, the street. They arrest the guy who did it, right? A guy named Aubrey James Norville. Aubrey James Norville pleads guilty. He shot three times with a shotgun. Aubrey James, Aubrey James Norville gets out of prison 18 months later before James Meredith has fully recovered from his gunshot wounds. So even if the law does arrest somebody and puts them on trial for attempted murder, 18 months, you shot a man three times. If James Meredith had gone and shot a white man in the South, think he's getting out in 18 months? You know the answer to that. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, and it really shows the disconnect of the value of life uh, uh, it, it, when this happened. And it's, it's, it's crazy. Now, if you're like, oh my gosh, that's the craziest thing I've heard. I bet that's the craziest thing that happens in the civil rights movement. Not even close. But we're not going to get into it today. Uh, that is, those are stories uh, for tomorrow. All right. See you guys tomorrow.